10 days to finding love and happiness. 10 dynamic days to make a difference. We hope to improve your health. We hope to improve your finances. We hope to improve your relationship. 10 days to finding love and happiness. Well, let's pray once more. Lord, as we open your word, we ask for your spirit to guide us. It's not about us, but it's about you. <clears throat> so our prayer is that you be lifted up and all women and men be drawn unto you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we've been looking at uh, 10 days uh, to finding love and happiness. And even though uh, Pastor Tull, uh, we are seeing him, seeing him this evening, but he's been following us. Uh, throughout the series and we appreciate that uh, pastor and we've been uh, as you know looking at these keys and uh, <clears throat> day one or key one uh, which of course parallel the ten commandments and what was our key for for that day <clears throat> now you know um, Michelle I have remembered we had one person who had filled out the sheet, the creation sheet, and we plan to give them a gift. I wonder if they're here tonight. Uh, yes, it's, it's a little hand at the back. Uh, please come, come, up, come up here. We can uh, barely see Zacchaeus, I mean that little hand. Please come on up, come on up. Now, <clears throat> we had a creation sheet that had, I think, 20 questions and None of the adults were able to fill it out, but uh, you, you, you did fill it out? Yes, please look them in the eye and answer that question. Did you fill that out? Okay, beautiful, beautiful. Well, we want to be sure to give you a gift and uh, just stay, stay right here. Don't go and we're going to bring you a gift while we just review. And so what was the first key, everyone? Choose Jesus, all right? And uh, you've, got, you've got it? Well, uh, do we have... Yes, uh, let's, let's give that one for the family. Did mom help you? Oh. <laughs> well, this is a book for the family. Is that all right? Thank you so much. Let's put our hands together. Thank you. All right. And then our second key was what, everyone? Choose God's word. Uh, choose God's word. That's right. And then the third key was what? Choose God's way. Because we said that uh, 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 Jesus said, uh, if you love me, keep my commandments. And he said, I am the way truth and the life. And the fourth day, the fourth key was choose God's day. That is correct. Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Then the uh, fifth, when we talked about uh, honoring father and mother, choose what? Choose respect, we said. Choose respect. And then the sixth day, uh, we spoke about uh, making the island safe. And the sixth commandment, thou shalt... Now, what did we say? Thou shalt not... Murder. murder. That's right, murder. And what was the key for that? Choose, choose life. And tonight, we're choosing love. And so, what we are saying is that these keys are the steps to finding love and happiness. When we start with the first one, thou shalt have no other gods before me, Jesus said... Uh, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and how many things would be added all and so really it's really one key that we need am I right pastor that first key and out of that comes all of these other joyful things and so these are critical keys and tonight we're looking at <coughs> choosing love now when we talk about that the seventh commandment which says of course thou shalt not <coughs> commit adultery and we're speaking about love 
But when we speak about love and marriage as uh, pastors, uh, <clears throat> Pastor Hector, Pastor Tall, we want you to know that when a couple stand before us to get married, it is not <clears throat> two persons that we see, it is six. It is how many? <clears throat> six. Oh no. Let, let me come this side. So when a couple stand before, it's not two persons that we see, it's how many? It's six. There is the man that he thinks he is. Then there's the man that she thinks he is. And then there's the man that he really is. Am I right about it? Then there's the woman that she thinks she is. And the woman that he thinks she is. And then there's the woman that she really is. Yeah? And the trick of marriage is to try to figure out who in the world have I gotten married to. That, that, that's what marriage is about. And, and how many know it will take a lifetime to find out? That's why you can't divorce just after one month. Because the Bible actually says, Beloved, it doth not yet appear what we what? Shall be. <laughs> What we shall be. And so marriage is a mystery. When you marry a person, you don't marry them for today. You marry them for tomorrow. What is around the corner? And you can't see what that is. That's why we need Christ to help us in marriage. And so when we look at the scripture, it tells us how we can be victorious. It tells us in Revelation, and they overcame him. <coughs> By what everyone? The blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not, did not love their lives to the death. And so, this passage of scripture gives us the keys for victory in marriage. It speaks about the life, the love, and <clears throat> the Lamb. The life, the love, and the Lamb. So, I'm hurrying to the first one the life. Now, when we meet couples to prepare them for marriage, we go through uh, probably 10 areas. Uh, that they should look to see their strengths and what we call their growth areas. We don't use the word weakness. We say growth areas. Is that, is, is, that, is that okay? And so we look at that together. And those, you know, will cover things like communication, conflict, leisure activities, finance, relationship roles, and so on and so forth. And to see what we have in common. And it is critical when we look at communication and conflict resolution there at the beginning, these are critical in the marriage process as we speak about our life together as a married couple. And uh, when we talk about listening skills, they speak about active listening, it can be summarized in this, that the L of listen stands for look at me, stands for what everyone? Look at me. So when we talk about look at me, what's that phrase that we often use? Something about the eye. Eye, eye contact. I think you've heard it, yeah? Eye contact. So that's what look at me means. It means that one sign that a person is listening, is, is, is listening to you, is that they're actually looking at you right? And that will convey to the person, not only that you are listening, but eye contact also conveys that you care. Actually conveys that you care. So the L stands for look at me. The I stands for interest yourself. One author said, if you're not interested in what the person is saying, act interested. Yeah? Act interested. Uh, so, so that is a sign that you matter. It's a sign that you matter. So when he's speaking to you about Liverpool Football Club, and, and it means nothing to you, act interested. Am I right about it? That's what we're speaking about. Okay, and then the, the, the S of listen stands for sit attentively. Now, now, um, now, that means, maybe I should just uh, demonstrate that. That means that when you, let's have it up this side. Thank you. When you uh, are with an individual and you're speaking and you're sitting, thank you, uh, Elder David, that um, you shouldn't uh, cross, uh, you know, everything and... 
not look them in the eye. What does crossed arms signify? Closed, doesn't it? Closed. Well, you, yeah, you keep talking, keep talking. You're not going to get through to me. You're not going to get through. That's what the cross means. But we should have our posture, um, arms uncrossed and uh, slightly leaning forward and looking the person in the eye. And then the um, T stands for tell me you understand. In other words, paraphrase uh, what I'm saying so that it tells me you understand. E stands for encourage me. That may even be just nodding. Sometimes you don't have to say a lot, just uh, nod. And, uh, and um, the N stands for not yet. Just when you're tempted to stop listening, listen for 30 seconds more. Yeah? Sometimes, you know, somebody's speaking and you think that you know what they're about to say. And you jump in and the person says, no, that's not what I was saying. And, and if you just listen for 30 seconds more, uh, you may get the full picture. Now, one husband, uh, he, uh, his wife was speaking to him and he was reading his newspaper. And he said, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And he said, mm-hmm. Uh, and he kept reading, and then he remembered that he had been to a seminar like this. And he said, oh, and his wife was speaking, and he, 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 he closed the newspaper, and he put it down, and he uncrossed his arms, he unfolded, he leant forward, he looked her in the eye. She was so flabbergasted <laughs> that she lost her train of thought. And she said, now you are deliberately listening just to confuse me. <laughs> See, people are not used. <laughs> people are not, are not used to, to, to being listened to the way that, that they should. And so there's that. Then, of course, there is conflict, conflict. Now, uh, you know, uh, maybe, P Patty Jean, could you... Uh, Maybe be Mary <laughs> and uh, Dave. You could take the uh, thank you. And uh, it's just one line, huh? Okay. Then uh, I'll take it from there. But uh, this is Mary now, and and really what we are asking is, uh, with what we've learned, what is the most appropriate response? Is that is is that okay, everybody? Okay, so Mary. Oh, my feet, they're so tired from standing all day. Oh. Hmm. Sounds as if you need to wear more sensible shoes. <laughs> so say no if it's no. No. Okay. You need to know when to work and when to rest. Sounds as if you've had an exhausting day. My feet never ache like that. No? You sound just like your mother. Okay. Now, <laughs> now, the question is, which answer have you been giving? That's the question, right? Which answer have you been giving? Okay, so we are talking about conflict now. And um, this is a discussion that, you know, you have never had. Uh, in your home. And so let's look at uh, he. I need more socks. So go and buy some. I, I thought you could pick them up since you'll be out this afternoon anyway. You're just like your father, always ordering somebody around. <laughs> oh yeah? At least my mother could cook. Well, well she's a mess herself. She hasn't had a decent haircut in years. Well, you ought to do something with your hair. It's ridiculous. Not that there's room in the bathroom with your stuff scattered everywhere. Now, when we argue, the Bible says, <clears throat> be angry and what? Sin. Sin not. So arguing in itself is not a problem, but there are rules. Just like in boxing, there are rules we should not hit below the belt, yeah? And there are some things here, would you agree with that? Yeah. That are below the belt. 
And uh, one of the things is often when we say you, you know, you always and you never, yeah? Uh, so somebody didn't, you know, you always come home late. And then the, the husband thinks back to 1975, that day when he came in. Yeah? So, so you always causes the person to be defensive. Right? But we should say, I feel. You know, when you come in late, I, I, I feel unloved. Yeah? The person can't say, no, you didn't. You know, that, that's how you have made me feel. And so we should be careful. The other thing is, uh, we should not be historical or hysterical. Yeah? We shouldn't be his historical or hysterical. Now, historical means, one person said, if a thing is more than six months old, it is inadmissible evidence, right? You, no, you, you can't bring it up in the argument. Uh, as some people, some people are archaeologists. Yeah, the archaeologists, they they dig deep. I remember once in our home, we were having uh, my home bring, coming up in England. We were having a discussion, and, and and my mother went all the way back to Jamaica, and we had never been there. You know, yeah. So, don't be hysterical or historical, all right? Let's give uh, Patty Jean a round of applause. Thank you, man. Okay. And so, we are speaking about the life as a married couple. And we should really, Willard Beecher, uh, uh, Willard Beecher tells of how many people believe that marriage is a box full of goodies, a box full of candies, and we can dip our hand into the box, take the goodies out of the box, and the box will always remain mysteriously full. But the truth is that marriage is not a box full of goodies. Marriage is in reality an empty box. You cannot expect to take out of the box what you have what? Not put into the box. And so you need to put, what kind of things could you put into the box? Well, put some smiles into the box. Uh, put some compliments into the box. Put some uh, love notes uh, into the box. Put some thank yous into the box. Uh, put some date nights uh, into the box. Uh, married couples, put some hotel reservations uh, into the box the box. Um, put some cruise vacations uh -oh, into the box. And bottom line is, men especially, you know, dip your hand in your pocket and put some money into the box. What do you say? Put some money into the box. Now, my wife said to me when we got married, Patty Jean said that her mother, when her mother would wash the clothes, that her father would put some money uh, into, uh, you know, or leave money, I should say, in the pockets that when she was sorting the clothes, um, you know, he she would find this money. And, and Patty Jean, you know, I, I didn't know why she was telling me this story. <laughs> you know, it seemed like a parable or fairy tale or, you know, so I, I said, well, a lovely story, but I kept my money. Now, now, so, so put some money into the box, all right? So we're speaking about the life, the life as a married couple, ups and downs, the life. But then there is the love, the love. And the truth is that the Bible says, husbands, uh, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself and let the wife see that she respect her husband. So the Bible standard of love is Jesus himself and his sacrificial love for us. That's our standard. So we don't have the world standard of love, but we have the Bible standard. Uh, one author, Dr. Uh, Wallace Denton, he said the whole concept 
of love is so distorted and perverted in our society that it is difficult for people to get a clear sense of the proper basis for marriage. He said our understanding of love is that it is some kind of intoxicating frame of mind or a visitation from outer space which overwhelms us and leaves a person in an eternal state of being high. He said as a family counselor, I often see people who assume that since they are no longer what? High, they are no longer in love. I tell my students that love is a very poor basis, meaning that feeling of being in love, on which to get married, and that if all they have going for them is a high, then they need to what? Terminate the relationship. He ended with these words, I think it takes a lot more than love on which to build a marriage, you need loyalty, commitment, money, money, uh, money, <laughs> and on and on, yeah? And on and on. And so this is what we are speaking about. It's not just this emotion, but it is a decision, a decision of the mind. Uh, in the book, uh, The Mystery of Marriage, um, these words uh, were written, which really impressed me. Love convinces a couple that they are the greatest romance that has ever been, that no two people have ever loved as they do, and that they will, con they will sacrifice absolutely anything in order to be together. And then marriage asks them to prove it. Yeah? So marriage will put all your words, all of your profession to the test. Marriage. And this commandment, that we are speaking of today is the most severe test that can come into the marriage. And when adultery does come in, it is often insidious, it is often gradual. It doesn't always just happen uh, directly like that. Um, some Christians uh, uh, authored a book, or one, one person authored a book of Christians who were saying, what had caused them or how it was that they had fallen into uh, adultery. It was actually 15, 15 steps they spoke about, but I'm just going to share, um, summarize them this way. Uh, one in, in these five steps, one of them was sharing common interests. Sharing common interests. In other words, these Christians said, well, we had so much in common it was uncanny. We both shared a burden for the church. That sounds okay, doesn't it? We, 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 we just talked about the church. And, uh, and, 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 and we, we found a, we were having a connection. But it, it, there was no thought of adultery. Are you with me? There was, that was not their thought at that time. They were just holding the apple. But somebody's coming in now. Uh, slithering into the discussion. The second step was they started to talk about personal matters. Be careful when you speak to somebody other than your spouse about personal matters. There's a sacred circle around every Christian marriage into which no outside person should interfere in certain areas. And so these uh, Christians, they said, we would just talk about things, not big things. And one said, no one had ever really believed in me until he came along. Yeah? So that's stage two. Then stage three, we started looking forward to being together. I look forward to choir practice every week. Beware of choir practice. <laughs> I look forward to choir practice every week. <laughs> Because I knew he would be there. Yeah, I knew he would be there. And the truth of the matter is, you need to test yourself. You need to be aware of yourself. We should not deceive ourselves. If we sense we're having, why am I looking forward to choir practice so much? Sometimes, men, you have a certain cologne you put on, uh, you know, on Sabbath. And, so, and then midweek, you find yourself slapping on this. What, what, why are you slapping it on mid midweek? Are you, are you going somewhere? Oh, no, no, no. Just, I'm just, I'm just, I just like it. No, 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 no. Ask yourself, why am I doing this? 
and listen to your spouse. Our spouse, our wives have a sixth sense, Pastor. They have a sixth sense. Uh, they can spot things that we men often are blind to, all right? And so the fourth one is embracing and kissing. She was slim, attractive, and dressed sharp, quite different from my wife. It just felt so good to be hugged and loved by somebody who really cared about me, all right? And so slowly you see the person is getting to the line of crossing the line of sexual intercourse. One thing led to another and finally we ended up in bed with each other. And here's what this woman said, I completed my journey of unfaithfulness to my husband. I had sex with this man. In other words, the unfaithfulness did not start with the act. Yeah? That was the completion of the journey. And so we just need to realize that that is the process. And when adultery happens, the Bible says, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard, but it was not this way from the beginning. I tell you, anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. But persons do ask the question, well, when adultery happens, does divorce have to take place as a result? Yeah? And uh, Dr. Alan Lloyd McGuinness in his book, um, The Romance Factor, he said, the scriptures take an unequivocal position, an affair is always wrong. Would you agree with that? Uh, but remember that it is not the end of your marriage unless you want it to be. I know of many wonderful marriages in which there has been such an earthquake in the past and in which the wrong partner is very glad that he or she did not panic unnecessarily. A slip is not necessarily the end of the world. Even if you lose a round in today's highly competitive game of love and sex, <clears throat> it should not be the end of your self-esteem and it need not be the end of your marriage. Does that make sense, everyone? Need not, so Moses or God or the Bible permits it, but it does not mean that it has to happen. And you say, well, how do I bounce back then from such a thing? And uh, how can I even feel loving toward her or toward him, should this take place? It is less about the feelings and more about the mind, especially in the first instance. In the book, For Better, For Worse, For Keeps, the authors say the way to, re to renew a marriage doesn't begin with a change of emotions, but with an act of will. It is a decision that we make in the mind. And so in the stage of adultery, sinking, we remember Peter, who the Bible says, and beginning to sink. Doesn't mean that you have to sink if this has taken place. Beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And how many know that a cry like that never goes unanswered by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So, so, so there's the life, there's the love, and finally the Bible speaks about the Lamb. The Lamb. The Lamb. Uh, the Bible says in Revelation 12, 17, the dragon, or the devil, was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. In other words, the Bible symbolizes the woman or the relationship with the church. And it is saying that just as adultery is come to divide husbands and wives, so the devil is trying to divide God's people from Jesus. Are we together with that? And so we have to ask ourselves, if we fall, what does the song say from uh, Donnie McClurkey? We fall down, but what? But we get up. And, uh, you know, they don't sing this in, in church, but Humpty Dumpty, yeah? It sat on what? The, the wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great for all the king's horses and all the king's men. Couldn't put Humpty together again. And one commentator said, 
what about from a biblical perspective? Can a broken egg be put back together again? Although the Bible doesn't mention God's ability to restore a broken egg, it does mention his ability to restore other broken or lost things like broken hearts and lost years. And of course, that nothing is impossible for God. Therefore, we must assume that for God, putting Humpty Dumpty or any other broken thing back together again is no problem. What do you say about that? It's not a problem for God. And so we heard about um, the Return to Palau movie and <clears throat> the struggle with forgiveness. And of course, this is a struggle when adultery takes place. And some of you may have, uh, remember another movie or a book called The Hiding Place. Did anybody remember that? Corriton Boone and how uh, in, the, in, the, in the wartime as a Jew, uh, she was abused by the German soldiers. And years later, she was at a place giving a talk and she recognized the German soldier standing there. And she said, even as the angry, vengeful thoughts boiled through me, I saw the sin of them. Jesus Christ had died for this man. Was I going to ask for more? Lord Jesus, I pray, forgive me and help me to forgive him. Did she feel like forgiving him? No, she didn't feel like it. She said, give me, Lord, give me your forgiveness. And so I discovered that it is not on our forgiveness any more than on our goodness that the world's, that the, uh, world's healing hinges, but on his. When he tells us to love our enemies, he gives us, along with the command, the love itself. And she said this, For a long moment, we grasped each other's hands, the former guard and the former prisoner. I had never known God's love so intensely as I did then. Well, I want to end and, and say that uh, when I went to my <coughs> baby sister's wedding in England, um, the minister, he said there are three C's in a marriage. How many C's? Three C's. He said they are uh, communication, compat compatibility, and commitment. And he said... All of these are important, but which of them is the most important? All right? So what do you think? Uh, how many for communication? All right, all right, yep. And then uh, what about compatibility? How many think that one is the most important? Okay, yep. And then uh, commitment, what do you say? Commitment, yes. Uh, now, communication is critical, and, uh, you know, books have been written... Communication key to your marriage, uh, that's very important. Uh, but I've known couples well able to communicate, call each other up on the phone years after the divorce. <laughs> In other words, <laughs> the communication didn't keep them together. Are you with me? Okay. And then, and then there's compatibility. And Chuck and Bob Schneider, they wrote a book called Incompatible grounds for a great marriage. They said that you ought to use the differences not to drive a wedge between you, but or in, in order to strengthen your relationship. So those two are not the most important, but it is actually commitment. And when we look at commitment, it hinges on a certain word. The Christian faith often operates with a lack of evidence that seems ridiculous to the rest of the world, it seems to contradict the plain facts with a foolhardy nevertheless. Yeah, I know, I know, he, he gets angry. Yep, nevertheless. Yeah, I know that this and I know that that, yes, I'm aware of it, nevertheless. Girl, if I were you, I would leave you. You know, you know some of them are waiting for you to leave him. <laughs> are you with me? If I were a girl, I would just get out, get out. But just leave your key. But, okay, so, so, nevertheless, nevertheless. And so, as we close, I think of uh, 
Uh, Patty, should we uh, just give this uh, <coughs> bow? We want the, the uh, ladies, sing, uh, uh, single or married, we would like us to just uh, follow uh, Patty Jeannie. And if the gentleman, if you just repeat with me. Uh, men, uh, so this is what Elizabeth Actemeyer has called Christian commitment. Men, together, I will be with you. Am I by myself? Men, I will be with you no matter what happens to us or between us. Women, if you should become blind, tomorrow I will be there. If you achieve no success or status in our society, I will be there. When we argue and are angry, I will work to bring us together. When we seem totally at odds and neither of us is having our needs fulfilled, I will persist in trying to understand and in trying to restore our relationship. When our marriage seems utterly sterile and going nowhere at all, I will believe that it can work and I will want it to work and I will do my best to make it work. And when all is wonderful <clears throat> and we are happy, I will rejoice over our life together and continue to strive to keep our relationship growing and strong. Christ has promised us, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Let's all say this last part together. Christians, Christians in, in marriage, marriage take, take upon, upon themselves, themselves that, that same unreserved commitment. commitment. Can we say amen to that? Thank you very much. Conrad, you may play something. I was... Uh, in Toronto, Canada, pastoring and uh, this scene became real to me that Christ has committed himself to us even though we are broken and I had a church member come to me she said pastor I'm married to a Christian he's not from our church <clears throat> but we have a tradition pastor and you're new and I'm asking if you will just uh, want to join in I said well what is it she said well uh, my husband's minister uh, he brings him to our house once a year <coughs> uh, for Sunday lunch. And uh, then I bring my pastor. We, they both bring their families and we have Sunday lunch together, fellowship together. And that's all it is, pastor. Pastor, would you be willing to meet my husband's pastor and fellowship? I said, sure, uh, we will do that. So we came together and uh, her, her husband's pastor came in and we talked, but I was surprised because I, I, I am normally talkative, but I found that my conversation uh, was starting to dry up and I didn't know what next to say. Normally you say to somebody that you just meet, well, well, what do you do? But I already knew what he did. And so I, I said, well, what else do you do? He said, well, what do you mean? What else do I do? I said, well, I don't know what I mean, by, but I'm just trying to think of something to say. And so I said, uh, I started to think, well, what do I do? So I said, well, um, uh, do you write? He said, write what? I said, I don't know. I'm just simply asking. Do, uh, I sort of said, well, uh, books. Do you write books? He said, no. He was a very humble man, unlike me. And uh, he said, no. I said, well, do you, do you write um, articles? He said, no. I said, anything do you, do you write anything he said yes I, I nearly said thank God and and I said so I said I said what is it that you write hymns hymns I I said hymns he said yes hymns I said well uh, any any hymn that I may know he said oh no he said you wouldn't know it's not well I said, well, okay, well, share it with me anyhow. Uh, share with me one of the hymns that you've written. He said, days are filled with sorrow and care. Hearts are lonely and drear. 
burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. I was conscious that my mouth was wide open. I would dearly have exchanged any book that I had written for just one stanza of that hymn from my newfound friend, John Moore. Gave me a signed copy of that hymn. And I stopped by to say to someone today, no matter what situation you may be going through, burdens are lifted at Calvary. As we close, could we stand together and maybe sing that song? Days <coughs> are filled with sorrow and care. Hearts are lonely and dread. Your care. Cast your care on Jesus today. Leave your worry and fear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Last verse, troubled soul, the Savior can see. Troubled soul, the Savior can see. Every heartache and tear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Let's sing it as if we mean it now. Burdens are lifted. Pastor Tull, could you come and give us our prayer of commitment? We are, if you are here with your spouse, please uh, hold their hand. And uh, we know some of you, your spouse is not here today, but <laughs> we are praying today that uh, we would be committed to each other. But the key to our commitment to each other is that we are committed to Christ, married to Christ. And today we appeal to you to be married to Christ. Pastor. Amen. Let us pray. Father God, we come to you in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for the message presented here tonight by your man servant, Dr. Brown. God, as he has clearly presented life, love, and the Lamb, we recognize, oh God, in this life, there are uh, many things that happen, but you are truly with us. You love us. And you have given, Lord God, tools for us to have better relationships and a better marriage. You know, Lord God, that prevention is always better than cure. And so we thank you for, Lord God, the tools presented here tonight. But God, we know that love is uh, between a man and a woman is one of your 
uh, Lord God, greatest examples while here on earth, Lord God, of what love would look like. And so we thank you for, Lord God, the love that you have between the man and the woman that are here today. Lord God, in this place, the husband and wife, Lord God, those who may be listening by way of online, I ask a special blessing upon their marriage. And God, even as we consider the lamb, we know that there are things that have been done, Lord God, that we probably did not please each other, Lord God. And so we ask for forgiveness where we have done wrong. Lord God, we know that you're a loving and a forgiving God. And so we thank you that the burdens are lifted at Calvary. We thank you for the opportunity to start anew. And so God, I ask, oh God, that even right now, there may be marriages that may be struggling. We ask that you would take a hold of that marriage and bring about your restoration power. Let your Holy Spirit move right now. God, we pray that you would sabotage the plan of the enemy on that marriage. That Lord God, you would bring it back, Lord God, into how you desire it, Lord God, them to live together. And so we thank you uh, for how you are moving in this place. Thank you for, Lord God, the seventh of 10 days here at the Warwick Church. And as they continue, Lord God, in this series, I pray that your Holy Spirit will continue to move in a mighty way to restoring relationships and to making relationships greater in the name of Jesus. Thank you. In your name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. 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 Thank, Thank you, Pastor. Pastor.